So given we're really trying to maximize our exhaust velocity, VE, we really need to take a look at the fuels that are going to do this. Yes, so what we'd like is an ideal fuel will have a lot of combustion energy. That's right. So you want a lot of energy when you burn it. But you'd also want one that's fairly dense, so yep. you can fit it in a small fuel tank, because if it's very low density stuff, then your fuel tank is going to be enormous, it's going to weigh a lot, it's going to add to your dry mass. That's right. Um, so, you, and pr it probably also nice that the fuel is non-polluting, fairly mm. cheap, not horribly toxic and carcinogenic. E that's right, easy to store, easy to get, that's, that's right. And this is going to be one of those things that you can't match all of these things. So if you just want raw energy per kilogram, yep. then the best fuel, and one other trick you're going to need is on Earth when you burn, say, petrol in your car engine, it's combining your hydrocarbons with oxygen. oxygen. That's you right. get the oxygen from the air. That's you right. have air filters on your car, right? Exactly. So the air goes in, merges with the fuel and burns. But in space, you haven't got that. In principle, you can have an air breathing motor for the first few kilometers. Um, and people have experimented with scramjets and things yep. like that. But once you're more than a few kilometers up, there's not much oxygen. Uh, and so you're going to need to carry your oxidizer which may or may not be oxygen, with you. So this is going to be the second component that we don't have to deal with here on Earth, the thing that actually allows our fuel to burn. Like if you wanted to drive your car on the moon, you're going to need to have two fuel tanks, one for the fuel and one for the oxygen That's to, right. to burn it with. So you need to carry fuel and an oxidizer. Um, and if you look at you can look at the table of all the different possible fuels and oxidizers and see how many joules of energy you get per kilogram. And it turns out that pretty much the best practical one is hydrogen plus oxygen. That's right. It's, uh, it's, it gives you about 120 megajoules per kilogram from this combination. The reason it's so good is not because you get a particularly strong chemical bond that gives it a lot of energy, it's just the hydrogen is really light. Yes. So you get one bond for only one proton. So that means you get more energy per kilograms from yep. hydrogen than you do from anything else. And this, it turns out, will give you an uh, exhaust velocity about 4.5 kilometers a second, 4,500 meters per second. That's right. Which is pretty good. That's about 50% you know, more than we were talking about for the Falcon rocket. Yes. Which means your mass ratio is going to be less ridiculous. That's right. And it's only about half the delta V we need to get into space in the first place. Yes, yeah, so you can have the exponential 2 rather than exponential 3. And because exponentials are so steep that much, that's going to help you a that's lot. That's going to be a big difference. But it has some drawbacks. Yep. First drawback is, I mean, you're not going to use gaseous hydrogen, otherwise your spacecraft would look like a Zeppelin, and there's no way you can push that into space. That's right. So you're going to have to cryogenically cool it to yes. its liquid. And hydrogen's a slippery customer. It's really hard. It tends to diffuse between the atoms of your metal, and your metal's also going to be cooled so cold that it's going to get, become very brittle. Yes, so you have to store it really cold, which means the tanks have to be designed to withstand those extremely cold temperatures. And be pressurized enough to actually still contain the hydrogen itself. Yes. Um, so this is difficult, but this challenge has been overcome. Yes. People have figured out how That's to right. build fuel tanks. It's still going to be quite large because it's low density. Yep. So your fuel tank is going to be large. And this has been used in a lot of rockets because of that enormous VE you can get from it. So here, for example, is uh, the Blue Origin. Um, this is a new Shepard rocket Shepherd, from Blue yep. Origin. And this doesn't get into orbit. It just goes little hops up with the tourists and back down again. So it doesn't, right. doesn't have to achieve the huge delta V to get to orbit. But the new Glenn, which is their bigger version, is taking a similar concept, but enough energy to get if, into if they, orbit. If they ever get it to work. That's, this has been a, it'll be launched next year for considerably more than a year now. <laughs> a few years now. And this is a hyd liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Yes. Oxygen also, if you want to fit it reasonably densely into a fuel tank, it needs to be liquefied and cooled. But it's nothing like as bad That's as hydrogen. It's still rather corrosive in your engines. Mm. It oxidizes your engines as well as your hydrogen. But the way you can tell it's a hydrogen engine is the transparent rocket jets at the bottom. Yeah, I guess you can clearly tell there's exhaust, but you can pretty much just look right through it. Yeah, so generally if you see something like that, that's telling you it's a, usually it's a hydrogen oxygen uh, to get that enormous delta V. Yep. Uh, so this is definitely one that uses it. If you look at the space shuttle, the outside boosters are definitely not hydrogen That's oxygen. Right. We'll talk about them in a bit. They're solid rocket boosters. But look at the flames coming out of the actual orbiter. That's right. You can see it's quite clear. And in fact, this giant tank is your oxygen tank. And your hydrogen tank. That's right. So you have liquid oxygen and hydrogen all sitting in the same, which is why that tank is so big. That's right. Because they're not very high density. And it's triagently cooled. That's so right. when these things take off, you see all the ice falling down yes. from the outside that's formed around because it. Because it has been frozen at hundreds of degrees. Yes. And indeed, the Artemis, Artemis. SLS rocket has 
has two solid boosters at the outside and then the boosters in the middle are you can't see anything coming out of them. That's right. And that's because it's again the hydrogen oxygen. There is stuff coming out. In fact, these are exactly the same engines we saw on the space shuttle. Yes, they're the exact same. Them. But they've been updated a little bit, but yes, more yeah. or less the same sort of engines. So yes, this is used, but it does have some drawbacks. The other most common choice is to burn, instead of you earning hydrogen, you merge your hydrogen with some carbon to make a hydrocarbon. Yes. Uh, whether it be something like uh, a refined rocket fuel, RP1 is a right they used, which is a particular thing that comes out of your oil refineries. Yep. It's a rather complicated mix of hydrocarbons. Or methane. Yes. Or, it actually doesn't really matter what sort of hydrocarbon you use. They all have about 50 megajoules per kilogram. In fact, even a ham sandwich is a hydrocarbon and has about 50 megajoules per kilogram. In fact, it's actually about 30. I worked it out once. <laughs> um, the trouble is trying to push it down a fuel pump and into a... <laughs> May not be the, uh, the most effective. But in principle, you could power an engine with ham sandwiches. Um, the benefits are they're much denser, which means you can get away with a much smaller fuel tank. That's right. Which means your dry mass can be less. Yep. And also it doesn't need to be cryogenically cooled. Yeah, that's right. But if you're burning it with oxygen, you still need to cryogenically cool the oxygen, so it's going to be half cryogenically cooled. But it's an improvement over the other issues. Yeah. Uh, but we still, get, yeah, you still run into all those issues of the oxygen, as we talked about before. It is corrosive. It corrosives the energy, the, 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 the engines themselves. Mm and it has to be stored. And this is what's used by the Falcon 9 rocket. Yep. So it's uh, RP1 plus methane. Yep. Well, so RP1 plus so liquid oxygen. Yep. So they do need to cryogenically cool. You can see all the, the cold gas coming off the outside here. That's and that's right. because it's all cold and ice is falling off it. Here's a takeoff just showing some astronauts getting onto one of their Crew Dragon launches. That's right. So they, uh, for context, they climb inside in their cool looking spacesuits. They had to make it look different from the old Apollo ones, because otherwise it looks stressingly similar. And, and here then, we have the actual takeoff. That's right. And you can tell this is not a hydrogen oxygen one by how bright it is. That's right. Um, and yes, you're getting less delta V, only about three, three and a bit kilometers per second delta V. But you've got other benefits. You see it going off sideways to go into space. That's right. You've had a lot less fuel you had to come on board in terms of density, which means your tanks are smaller which means you can make them more efficient. Yep. So as you said, it's all trade-offs. You're not going to get one thing that does everything. Yep. It is how you trade it off. And another hydrocarbon, this is SpaceX's uh, Starship, Starship uh, which again, this is a test flight. We're still waiting in the next couple of months on the real flight. Hopefully by the time you watch this, you'll, it'll actually have been into space and hopefully not blown up in the process. But this one is also a hydrocarbon plus liquid oxygen, but now it's using methane. Yes. Which is actually why it looks a bit cooler than uh, the, the huge flames from the RP-1. Uh, why do they use methane? It's actually about the same delta, the VE. Yep. So it's not used because of best thrust. It's used for two reasons. One is they're hoping this rocket will eventually be landing on Mars and coming yep. back, and you can synthesize methane on Mars. That's right. Um, and, and, and you can synthesize hydrogen, so you can you dig up the water vapor and get various other carbon things on Mars and use that to come back. The other benefit is that it leaves less gunk in your engine. Yes. You can see it's burning much more cleanly, and the idea is that this will be capable of landing and being able to go again like relatively within quickly. a day. Yes. Whereas for the Falcon 9 rockets, the Merlin engines on that, they need to degunk them all the time because of all the hydrocarbon yes. products.